What's going on folks, Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and I'm finally getting around to watching the How Dungeons & Dragons Started video that released a couple days ago on D&D's YouTube channel. It is a 38 minute video, I'm going to play it at 1.25 times speed to kind of speed that up a little bit, and we'll see how we do. So again, if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please consider doing that, and uh, let's dive in. This is the big question. When did D&D begin officially? Because we've talked, to, yes. we've talked about this before. On February 7th, 1974, Gary Gygax takes an index card because he, he was too cheap for postcards. <laughs> he used index <laughs> cards. He put a postcard stamp on an index card. I think they were just probably easier to write on because an index card gives you lines, right? And he, on an index card, he, he writes a note to Dave and tells Arneson, uh, printing on the first draft, the, uh, printing on the first original Dungeons & Dragons is almost done. Almost done. The 7th of February, almost done. Your copy will be in the mail soon, and we have that postcard. Well, that means that printing wasn't done yet. And at this early stage, the only way to get D&D at this point was through the mail. You would send in mm. a $10 check to TSR, which had only been created a couple of months before in late 1973, yeah. and they would send you a box. Now, some people, some stores had begun to order copies, but it wasn't really on shelves. Right. But in the second week, second or third week of February is probably the soonest that we can say fans got their copies of d d in the mail. So sometime second or third week of February is probably about the closest we can really nail it down for sure. Now, that's the first time that fans get it, but you could measure it different ways if you want, if you want to make the window bigger. Yeah, it's hard with invention, right? Because like clearly d right. d was being play tested. That's right. Is that the birth? So, like, or is it when those two games combined? Like when they said, hey, this is something bigger, we call it d d Yeah. And we know, for example, that, that Gary ran his D&D game on Sundays at his home. Right. And he had copies of the game before the printing was done. So if you want to celebrate in late January, oh, yeah. <laughs> great, mm -hmm. go ahead, because it was, it was being played. Yeah. Fans didn't have it yet, but Gary had it, and he was running it for his players. Um, many years later, TSR would copyright Dungeons & Dragons with a January copyright date. Right. But that's not really particularly relevant to what actually happened in 1974. That's just the, the month that they had to copyright it at, right? Uh, and we know that they had orders in January. Mm. So if you want to track by when they sold the first copy, yeah. sure, okay, late January. So you are involved in a book project, <laughs> correct? Right. What is that's that right. book? So our book is The Making of Original Dungeons and Dragons, 1970 to 1977. It's a long title, but it's a huge book. <laughs> and The Making of Original Dungeons and Dragons, 1970 to 1977. I also wonder if this means we might get like 1978 to sometime in the future and get like a series of these books over time, which would be kind of cool. Lex original documents from the 1970s that helped to create D&D and then the first version of D&D and then the things that came out for original D&D before advanced Dungeons and Dragons. So it collects 36 key sort of important documents and that includes some things people will recognize like we reprint the original brown box, the first printing of D&D, in its entirety, every page. Oh, we wow. We have all of the first three supplements, the key supplements for D&D, Greyhawk, Blackmore, Eldritch Wizardry, uh, first printings in their entirety. There are some exceptions to which I'll get to because some things we had particularly cool documents of that weren't first printings, they're second printings, but we had a really good reason to use those. So we have a whole early part of the book that covers uh, material before Dungeons & Dragons even existed as a name. Yeah. The thing that people have never heard of before and very few people alive have ever even seen. We have the original draft of Dungeons and Dragons that Gary Gygax typed out on his home typewriter in Lake Geneva in 1973. And wow. it is our privilege and great responsibility to share this culturally and historically important document with the world and with fans. Let's rewind a little bit and talk about this book more broadly. It's broken up into four sections, mm -hmm. four parts, that tell the story of the creation of Dungeons and Dragons. So we could talk about the Arneson Gygax controversy a little bit about the relationship and between them. There's a lot of concern, I think, amongst old fans about who is more responsible, who gets most of the credit for right. mm. Dungeons and Dragons. And I think that because Gary just wrote more, he's more visible. People associate his name with that. But Arneson was doing critically important work, as we trace in this book. And so if we try to assign credit. We, we feel like we can't really do that. Like, both men's work is absolutely vital. Dungeons and Dragons would not exist without both of these people. Mm -hmm. mm. And, importantly, it's 50 years later. We just, both of these men are dead. We, we don't have a lot of clarity about what exactly happened. We have some things, and we have a lot of documents that we reprint in this book. 
But I think there are some questions to which we will just never know the full answer. So our stance throughout this book is that both Arneson and Gygax are absolutely vital, mm. that there's some things we will never know, and we're just going to have to take it at that. But let's go back to kind of breaking down the four chapters of the book. So part one is everything before D&D existed. And it tells basically two stories. The first story is Gygax writing in fanzines. We've got, he wrote, he wrote an early article about the five different colors of dragons that came out in Fangorodrum. And these are the same dragons that show up later in D&D. And he gave them this, those same weird Latin, pseudo Latin yeah. names, Draco Electricus and all that stuff. And then he writes articles about explaining medieval weaponry and medieval armor in his local fanzine, stuff like that. And it culminates in the creation of Chainmail and the fantasy supplement to Chainmail. Now, Chainmail was a medieval war game, and that was not all that unusual. But what's unusual about it is it had this section at the end that described how to use your medieval miniatures to play fantasy war games. Okay, mm. This is the first fantasy war game. All the fantasy war games that you can think of and science fiction war games and all of those things, those are all descended from Chainmail, from the fantasy supplement for Chainmail. And we reprint that in its entirety. We actually use a second print so cool. supplement because that included some new spells and mm -hmm. some other new rules that show up later in D&D. Meanwhile, in Minneapolis St. Paul in the Twin Cities area, Dave Arneson is a grad student, 20-something grad student studying the Napoleonic era. And he takes the rules for chainmail and runs a new kind of game. In his wargaming group in the Twin Cities, there was a kind of game that had been created and played, which they called, in that club, they called a Brownstein or a Brownstein game. And what this was, the name comes from a game that was run, it was a Napoleonic war game, but players were not assigned armies. Some of the players were assigned individual characters yeah. in the town that the Napoleonic army was invading. And Arneson was assigned the role of a student in this war invasion, and he had his own sort of sub-goals, his own uh, objectives to accomplish that he could succeed at even if Napoleon conquered the town. The players of this group loved it. They just dug into it. So they started to do different versions of the Brownstein. They did a Wild West cowboy Brownstein, which they called a Brownstone, right? <laughs> and Arneson played El Poncho, right? It was his, his cowboy character yeah. in, the, in this Wild West Brownstein. So we have the newsletter where Arneson announces what he called at that time a medieval Brownstein. Well, this is the game that would become Blackmore, Brownstein. Brown Stone, Black Moor, right. right? And Black Moor was a, a fantasy medieval war game with role-playing aspects to it. So everybody had a character, right? But uh, they also had a, uh, their castle or their fortress or their army, and they were kind of running their little empires and their little domains, right? And they would come together and they would explore this multi-level maze, dungeon maze, that was called Castle Blackmoor. It's underneath Castle Blackmoor. Blackmore campaign only ran for about nine months, the original Blackmore campaign, but it's hugely influential. And we have a lot of documents from that campaign. We have character sheets from people who played in it, the wizard Gaylord. And we have after action reports of what happened during game sessions of the huh. Blackmore campaign. And Arneson was using the chainmail rules, but he had to invent a lot of new stuff. He had to create new rules for what the players wanted to do. And he was really keen on bringing in other materials and other sources. So for example, in 1973, Avalon Hill put out a board game called Outdoor Survival. And Outdoor Survival had a hex map that depicted mountains and woods and plains and mm -hmm. rivers. And the goal of the game was to cross the wilderness without dying, right? <laughs> yeah. You had a life level index that tracked your, your uh, starvation and dehydration and injuries from animals. And it started at 15. And when it got to zero, you were dead. Right. Well, that sounds kind of like hit points, yeah. doesn't it, right? <laughs> and Outdoor Survival had random encounters, which did not exist in the Blackmore game until then. So wild, Arneson man. uses Outdoor Survival as his outdoor wilderness travel map. He imports random encounters from Outdoor Survival. And he's innovating and creating on the, uh, on the Blackmore game. Well, in 1973, in January of 1973, Arneson travels to Lake Geneva. He'd already met Gary at a previous mm. Gen Con. He travels up to Lake Geneva. and he oh, Gen Con was happening Blackboard already. For Gary and his friends. Right? This is very fascinating. Gary loves it. There's two things about it in particular. The dungeon maze really captivates him. But also, Arneson had implemented a new idea about tracking the monsters that you kill. And those monsters are valued with points. Mm. That comes from chainmail. But we're going to track the number of points you get for killing every monster. And when you hit a certain numerical threshold, your Experience character gets more points. Mm -hmm. Right? Experience yeah. points and leveling. Yeah. And Arneson invents this, innovates this. 
And these two concepts, the dungeon maze and experience point tracking, really grab Gary, right? So he writes to Arneson, and we reproduce this in the book, a letter, a postcard actually, this is uh, so cool. asking Arneson for anything that he has on Blackmore. Send it to me, and we'll do an updated version of Chainmail. At first, that's what it was going to be. It was an updated version of Chainmail. Right. But once Arneson actually runs Blackmore, Gygax is like, oh, no, no, this isn't Chainmail. This is something new. This is a new game. Yeah. So we're going to take all of Arneson's innovations, and we're going to implement them into this new manuscript, this new game. And he, he asks Arneson, like, send me everything you've got, everything you've got on Blackmore. And Arneson sends him a bunch of his game notes, right? But that's what they were. They were game notes. They weren't a professional manuscript. They were the stuff that you write to prep for your campaign yeah. every week, right? And he sends all that material to Gygax, and Gygax starts assembling a publishable manuscript, and he titles it Dungeons and Dragons. And that's part two of the book. It starts off as a 50-page mm. rough draft, but Arneson makes notes on it. He sends a Gygax sends a copy to Arneson. Arneson makes notes, and Gygax makes more notes, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger until 50 pages becomes almost 100. And we reproduce every page of this original first draft of d and This is so cool. Like, this kind of historian stuff... I love this. Like, I'm all about this. I'm absolutely going to get this book. It, it, I mean, D&D is a huge part of my life, as you all know, so I have to get this book. But this is very fascinating. In this book. Then they start implementing it and using it. They start playing the new rules, and it kind of spreads around. And people start making changes. Well, not all those changes got back to Gary, and not all those changes got implemented in D&D. So we have a couple of variants of the original first draft the rules changes that were being used in the Twin Cities group and other playtest changes that were being made by playtesters. And so we reproduced those as well. So you can see the different versions of D&D that might have been variants, variant rules. Hmm. But in 1974, the first printing of all these materials started to come together. And now we're circling back to your question about birthday. Yeah. On February 7th, printed about 1,000 copies. And the first edition of D&D has never been reproduced by Wizards of the Coast before. Previous versions of this, we have reprinted the white box, which many people are more familiar with, right. the white box of D&D. But that's like a fourth, fifth, or sixth printing. What we have is the original first printing of D&D with all of its problems. Yeah. And it's got some problems. <laughs> right. There's a lot of errata, clarifications, that later were fixed and corrected in later printings. Another example of the changes. First edition, first printing OD&D has hobbits yeah. and ants <laughs> yeah, and balrogs in it. I had this. Yes, okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was, I remember it was surprising to see that. Well, <laughs> it, it, these are things from Tolkien's Middle Earth. Yeah. And, and TSR had no agreement to use those names. But they were a pretty small press, and no one found out, no one noticed or said anything for several printings. Yeah. In, by the white box, all of those changes, all those words have been replaced. So hobbits became halflings, and ants became tree ants, and yeah. balors, balrogs became balors. Yeah. But that's not what we reproduced. We give you the original first draft, first printing. Now, so cool. part four. After the game comes out, Gygax is starting to work up supplemental material. And these are the three supplements. The first was Greyhawk, the second was uh, Blackmoor, and the third was Eldritch Wizardry. And we reproduce all of those in their entirety. The first book, Greyhawk, is named after Gary's personal campaign. After we, if we get back in the time machine, go back to that first Blackmoor game that Arneson runs for Gygax, Gygax immediately starts running his own version of that game. Yeah. Mm. And he creates his own castle with his own dungeon underneath it, and that becomes Castle Greyhawk. And he's using a world which at the time they called the Great Kingdom. And the Great Kingdom had been created by Gygax for his wargaming club. And it was this sort of fantasy medieval world where everybody in the club had like a little kingdom, and they could do wars against each other using this Great Kingdom background. So Castle Greyhawk was a place in the Great Kingdom. And Gygax wrote a lot of, not the entirety of, but he wrote a lot of the material that went into mm. the first Greyhawk book. He had other people at TSR contributing as well. Oh, the OG And so it seemed natural that if the first classic. supplement was called Castle Greyhawk, the second one should be, be named after Blackmore, the, the huge influence on the game. And Dave Arneson's name is on the cover. And Gygax lavishes praise on Arneson in the introduction to Blackmore. But later, in private conversation and in written statements, Gygax said that really only a very small part of of Blackmore was actually written by Arneson, and that that part, the part that Arneson did write, had to be pretty extensively rewritten. Well, mm. we also know that Gygax was probably being pretty uncharitable in his estimation of Arneson by this time. The two men had fallen out because Arneson had sent all of his ideas to Gygax, but he didn't really have any say in how Gygax used those ideas. Right. Mm. right? And when Gygax left stuff out and chose what to keep and what to reject, Arneson wasn't really involved in that decision. That was Gygax at the typewriter making those decisions. Because it makes sense. And but... Arneson wasn't really happy about it, and you can see why. 
Like, yeah. And so, although he did end up joining TSR and he moved out to Lake Geneva and he worked there for a while, uh, the estrangement was pretty far along by 1975. Oh, wow, that quick, when huh? These books, Greyhawk and Blackmore, came out. Mm -hmm. We actually have, <clears throat> we have the in-house TSR copy of Blackmore, which has Gygax's notes on every page oh, saying wow. who wrote the material on that page. Wow. It doesn't go the whole way through the book. It only goes through about, about up to page 30. But it gives us an idea of certain sections that we know were written by other people. And, uh, and then Eldritch Wizardry had even more fan content, because the idea was kind of open the book up to fans and let people write. <laughs> what a world. We'll take all those ideas and we'll, we'll roll them into the book. And meanwhile, uh, you're still getting more new D&D material in Strategic Review, and then the first issue of the Dragon comes out. And as an example, the first appearance of the Bard, of the Illusionist of the Ranger. These are all created by fans. Mm. And Guy really? Gax pretty much just cut and pasted them and dropped them into the well, Advanced D&D Player's Handbook when that came out <laughs> later. But right around early 1977, the first issue of Dragon has come out and it's got some stuff for the Illusionist, for example, in there. It's got the Bouette, the first appearance of the Bouette. Yeah. Iconic monster. And all that stuff is official. It's considered official, a part of D&D. But in issue two of the Dragon, None of that stuff is official. They oh, clarify it. So that kind of creates a very interesting door. Now, what, what, what's going on behind the scenes is that TSR and Gygax had come to realize that they needed a whole new version of the game. They needed to almost rewrite the game really from the ground up. Gygax had been planning a kind of updated version of original D&D, which would be three products in one box. A oh, box set. One book to be a player's book. Yeah. One book to be a referee's guide. The term dungeon master was not originally a part of D&D, &D, and it was created by referee. fans, and it slowly works its way into the game. And you can see that in the materials in this book. That's so cool. Ugh. Second book for referees. And then the third book was going to be like a beginner's introduction to D&D, &D, like a kind of quick start on-ramping for the game. And he hired a professor named uh, Holmes, Eric Holmes, to do that. Well, Holmes worked very quickly and very effectively. And he created what we now call the Holmes Edition Basic Set D&D. But the player's book and the referee's book were taking a lot longer. And so Gygax wasn't really sure what to do at first, but it became pretty clear that we had to just rethink this whole three products in one box thing from the ground up. And this eventually led to Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. So we end our book with that. The I think there's gonna be more books in game. the future. And there were other reasons to do this too, because Arneson and Gygax were fighting over the legal rights. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and some folks saw the creation of a whole new game to be a solution to that debate. Mm, makes it make sense too. This has been a long kind of survey of everything that goes in the book, but we've left out a lot. Like there's a lot of really interesting and important stuff that we've kind of skimmed over. And I'll just give a few examples. When D&D first came out, people didn't understand this game at all. What is it? Sure. How do I play it? <laughs> what is a session of this game even like? Yeah. And so Gary wrote a column in a European wargaming fanzine called <laughs> Europa, where he explained the game and gave an example of play, which the brown box does not have. Right. There's no sample play in the original D&D. Hmm. Well, we have that column in Europa. and we reproduce So cool. It and you can see Gary's advice on how he thinks the game should be run, how, it, how it's played, what it's like. And in that article, we get some really interesting insight into how the game was played in 1974. It's very, very different than the game that we play today. Gary opens up his advice to DMs by saying, your players will start off working together. It won't last, he says. Pretty quickly, oh. after they get out of the dungeon, they'll split up and they'll all want to go do their own things. And they'll want to recruit followers and they'll want to go to the town or they'll want to start businesses or they'll want to find magic, uh, magic resources to, to boost their wizard's power or whatever. Let them do this. Encourage them to do this and, and, and let them all kind of become rivals in this overland world map that you've created. And they come together once in a while to go another level deeper into the dungeon or to fight off some big arch enemy that you've created for your setting. But, but mostly, they're world build, they're empire building and fighting each other and conspiring. Or maybe a couple of them get together and go off on an expedition and then they come back. The whole way that we think of a D&D party as like these five or six adventurers that get together and go down into a dungeon and, and they stick together mm. and they have a whole adventuring career together and we never split the party. Like that whole notion was totally foreign to how the game was played. Crazy. It's amazing. What? It is. It's really, really inter interesting. And you can see why it was done this way when you look at the, the logistics of running the game. 
because Dave and Gary both had like 16 players in their games, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot. And even uh, at one point, the, the book says, well, you probably want to keep it to like 12 players, 10 players, if you're 12? just brand new and starting. Like if you're, if you're a rookie DM, 10 players, that's your limit, right? I think we have to, we have to start a 12 to 15 player game <laughs> yes. in the studio. There you go. Just to see I how mean, this feels. I mean, but I'm not running that game. <laughs> so so you have, first off, you have very large groups. Yeah. And secondly, the players were kind of playing the game every day. Like they would give Dave or give Gary things that they wanted their character to be doing basically all the time. It yeah. was a 24-7 constant thing. Hmm. And as a referee, as a DM, you just can't create enough content yeah. for 16 players playing 24-7, <laughs> right? Like 16 who has the players. time to create dungeons and adventures for everybody in this world? Instead, hmm. you have to be like Godzilla versus King Kong. You just lean back and watch them fight, right? <laughs> And, and instead, you create like the mega dungeon, the big infinite levels mega dungeon that player characters cannot explore alone. They have to come together. And then you create big threats, like it's an invasion of barbarians from the north or something, yeah. right? And this becomes kind of your big story arc, but the real gameplay is the individual actions taken by characters as they amass power and rival each other and try and steal magic items or resources from each other. And it's a very, very different kind of game. But I, I think that the way that we play the game today is really born out of the tournament circuit. Because when you mm. demonstrate D&D, as Arneson did for Gygax in that fateful January 1973 session, you don't demonstrate the empire building part. Mm -hmm. no. You demonstrate the dungeon, right? Yeah. That's what captivated Gygax in the first place, was the maze, the dungeon-like maze, yeah. right? And players would come to Gen Con and they'd play the Tomb of Horrors or the Lost Caverns of the Sojikanth or whatever. Sojikanth, and that that's what they were to Was a bunch of people getting together, and the groups were very large, a bunch of people getting together and going through the Tomb of Horrors and half of everybody dying, yeah. right? And that dungeon experience was the game. And you take that back to your players and you run that game. And there were other things in these books about building your castles and hiring your soldiers and all that stuff, but, but it didn't grab players the way that the dungeon Delve, mm. did, you know, and so that's what they experienced. That's what they had fun with, and that's what they played, and that's ultimately what the game became. How did we manage to create this book? You had a you had a partner, right? Oh yes. Okay. So like, I'm, like, I'm so glad that you brought this up. Yes, absolutely. So John Peterson is a world famous historian, one of the greatest historians on D and D and gaming in general. Uh, he's the author of Playing at the World and The Game Wizards, A History of TSR, um, and many other books, uh, Ar uh, Art and Arcana, uh, Legends and Lore. Um, uh, he even helped to do to do Heroes Feast and a bunch of other books about D&D and about gaming. John came to us with the first draft that I described, the 100 or so pages. And, and he said, you know, we have to publish this. We have to get this out to the world. How are we going to do that? And that's when we started to figure out what was the best way to do that. And coincidentally, the 50th anniversary was coming up, yeah. right? <laughs> well, that seemed like the perfect time to do it. Mm. That's the Venn diagram, right? We take, we, we, we take this incredibly important historical document that was made 50 years ago yeah. and release it to the world in this anniversary celebration. So then it was just figuring out how are we gonna do it? What else are we gonna put in this book other than that? And how are we gonna, how are we gonna do it? What are we gonna make? And John provided uh, the vast majority of the, uh, of the documents in this book and also provided a commentary to sort of situate each document in the, in the history and in the narrative that we're telling about the creation of the game. And he explains all the people, the playtesters, and the artists, and everybody that was involved in making these games happen. That's a story. And we're deeply indebted to him because this book is real. about him. Holy we also God. had a fantastic graphic design and art team. I don't know if you've seen these original materials, but some of these original D&D books, you know, they're not much to look at. Right. Right? They're basically, they're, they're digest size. They're like the size of a fanzine, of a, of mm. a scene. They're, they've got pretty simple text, maybe a couple of tables, and then some black and white art much of which, by the way, is swiped from comic book art, right? Oh, Jesus. John had outlined all of this in Art and Arcana, and you can open up Art and Arcana and see yeah. the original comic book panels mm -hmm. that a bunch of these D&D &D art, art pieces are based on. Classic. The most famous example being the knight riding a horse on the cover of the brown box, yeah. which is straight out of a panel from Doctor Strange, when that's, that's the Black Knight, the character of the Black Knight riding his <laughs> black horse. Perfect. So anyway. there, there are a lot of documents that you, no one's... No one else has this, and no one else could publish this. That's right. This, this is a book that only Wizards of the Coast could do. Only we have the legal rights to this material, and only we have access. 
Now, if you want to spend $800 or $1,000, you can buy your own copy of the first printing of the brown box. <laughs> yeah. I can't vouch for the quality yeah, until right. <laughs> it shows up on your, on your doorstep. Mm. Or you can get it yeah. for our, in ours, where we give you every single page scanned in perfect detail and everything else that's included in this book. But to give you another example of the interesting ways that, that Wizards of the Coast became the only company that could do this, and we have all of Arneson's material, and we have all of Gygax's material. Now, some of Arneson's stuff we were not able to include, which was, which was unfortunate, because Gygax just wrote a lot. Yeah. And so we really wanted to include a lot of Arneson's material as much as we could. But in 1977, as the sort of demonstration of the estrangement, the animosity between Arneson and Gygax, Arneson had left TSR by that point, and he had started to write his own D&D products that he was going to publish. Uh-oh. He took his Blackmore material, and in cooperation with a company called Judges Guild, ah. he published a book called The First Fantasy Campaign. I know this. And it includes a lot of early Blackmore material. Not just Judges stuff that he Guild. sent to Gygax, but other material that he created for Blackmore later in subsequent campaigns. Well, we, we don't have the rights to that. Judges mm. Guild owns that version of the, that material. So we couldn't include it. But we include all the artist material that we can include, and that's quite a lot. Sure. But to, to give you another example of how uh, things came together for this product, I mentioned Outdoor Survival, this board game. And, and Arneson used the map from Outdoor Survival as his overland land map. Yeah. And in fact, in the brown box, original D&D, Gygax and Arneson tell the reader, go buy Outdoor Survival. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and use the map from Outdoor Survival for wilderness encounters and travel. Nice. Well, we, it just so happens that in 1998, Hasbro bought Avalon Hill, and we own Wilderness Survival now. Yeah. <laughs> okay? So we can reproduce the map from Outdoor Survival and the life level index cards and everything that, that Arneson was influenced by. And not any company could do that, right? And, right. and the, original, the, the original brown box and the three supplements and all of the old TSR materials and fanzines, long out of print, uh, impossible or virtually impossible to get. So we really tried to lean into the, the zine mm -hmm. art aesthetic of these products. We have an amazing interior that just highlights and kind of accents. This and art is so the, cool. Uh, the kind of punk aesthetic of these early zine books. And, uh, and the whole book is 576 pages. That's I mean, huge, dude. This thing. It's, <laughs> I love yeah, that. It's got a beautiful, fantastic uh, red and gold foil cover. Um, and, and it just feels, it feels as impressive and historic as it should feel for the contents that it has. What did you love doing Hell it yeah. so much? I am a recovering academic, like we <laughs> talked about, right? I, I am a former English professor, and I've worked with historical documents before. And I know some of the concerns and some of the, uh, the challenges that they pose. So the, on the one hand, it's, it's using my, my personal skills and talents in a way that I felt I, could, I had something unique to contribute. Yeah. But it's more than that, right? It's more than that. Because I remember some of this material. Now, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I, 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 I'm old, but I'm not that old. So I was about 10 when the Player's Handbook came out. So I didn't own the brown box or any of those original box, the white box, and that stuff. I was about 10 when the local chess club at the junior high school announced mm -hmm. that they were having a Dungeons and Dragons club. And I didn't know what it was. I thought, well, it's the chess club. Maybe it's some kind of weird variant of chess, like, like <laughs> the castles or the dungeons. And mm -hmm. I don't know. So I showed up at uh, the chess club, and, and the older kids at the junior high had the white box. And I made my first character, which was Antele the Quiet. He was a monk. We were using rules from Eldritch Wizardry. And the monster manual was out, but not the player's handbook when the players got there. And so I have a, a lot of fond memories of these early years of the game. Hell yeah. And, um, and it felt like I was the right person to be making this, you know. And it's, uh, it's important that this is a historical document. So there are yeah. things, it was a different time. So we've had an inclusivity review of all these materials. Multiple. So let's, let's take a step back here. Let's clarify. There are materials in original Dungeons and Dragons that would never pass yeah. our inclusivity reviews today. Uh, and a lot of it is, you can, some of it you can understand, like, okay, these are a bunch of war gamers, and they're using armies from history, and so when they create a warrior class yeah. for Dungeons and Dragons, they call it the fighting man, right? Because that's what they were used to, and they were all men, they were all white dudes from Lake Geneva and the Twin Cities. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? Like, right. there's a lot of material in this book, and I won't go over all of it, 
but it would not pass our inclusivity reviews today. It's well, 50 years old. We couldn't change it. It's, it's history. It's historical, yeah. What we can do is acknowledge it. Yeah. And show how far we've come. Sure. Because that's not D&D &D anymore, yeah. right? right? D and D gets more diverse and uh, has a larger audience every day. The more diverse the game becomes, the more people of different genders and ethnic backgrounds and and faiths see themselves in the game. Then they go make their own versions of the game. Yep. And more players start to see themselves represented in that. The more diverse the creators get, the more diverse the players become. Hundred percent. And that's the way it should be. More people so, in the game is good for the game. This book is very interesting because I think it really highlights how far the audience has come. Sure. And, and how the game has changed over the 50 years, like we were talking about earlier. Yeah. How it's played, who plays it, mm -hmm. and how it's created. That's, in many ways, the way that it's created is the part that changed the least. Because a huge driver in early D&D was fan creations. And that's yeah. That's true today. Still very true. true. Today. And... And I find it very interesting and, and very exciting to see how the game has grown, how the audience has grown, how we as creators, as designers, have learned from the past both what to do and what not to do. I think this book has a lot to teach us. But it's also just fun to see. Yeah. 100%. There, there, there I'm is a, a so kind stoked. Of grognard collector's desire for yeah, these materials. Right. But also, I, I honestly believe, and you, know, you can blame my years in the classroom for this, but I honestly believe that. People just want to know more about this thing that they love. Most of our players have never played any edition of D&D other than 5th. Yeah. This is the a only lot of them, yeah. ever known. Where did it come from? Where did this cool game come from? How was it made? What's the story? I got your story right here. <laughs> Again, I've talked about it in the past, right? I started with 3-5. I've never played a and d I never played OD&D. Um, John, uh, John Peterson was the historian... I don't think Todd actually introduced uh, the gentleman who was speaking. I just want to see if I can get his name here. This is the big question. When Todd did D&D begin What's his officially? Name? Because we've talked, to, yes. we've talked about this before. On February 7th, 1974. Okay. Jason, here, a phenomenal member of the D&D team. Senior game designer, D&D. &D. I didn't meet him personally, but I did see his panel at Gen Con, he was talking about the Book of Many Things, and he was definitely on that team. The man is amazingly passionate about this game, and I think it very clearly comes through in this video as well, and I'm stoked that he's involved, because honestly, from the little bit of stuff that I've seen, the stuff that he touches is good quality content for Dungeons & Dragons. I am so stoked for this book, I can't, it's July, I think is its release, it's right around my birthday, so that's perfect for me. Um, and yeah, I think he kind of hit the nail on the head on basically every single thing he said. I mean, so many of us play this game, have played it for years. He brought it up, and it is true, the majority of the player base, right, is 5th edition players, right? We're a long way from people placing an order in the mail to some random dude in Lake Geneva to send you a hundred book, um, or is it June 19th? Okay, June 19th. Uh, to send you a hundred page manuscript in the mail to play a game, right? You can go to a, a, you know, a store, any store basically almost, and buy a copy of D&D. You can go to Target, Walmart, bookstores or otherwise, and get yourself a D&D &D book. We are a long way from mail order D&D, &D. But a lot of those people, again, do play with 5th edition because that's what they know. And I, I mean, again, like I said, I started with 3rd, so I'm not exactly in the same boat. But I am fascinated by the history of this game that I love. And I would love to learn more about it. And it sounds like this book is going to give me exactly what I want in a just shy of 400-page tome. Like, um, this is huge. I'm very pumped about this. Uh, and I do truly hope that the making of original D&D &D 1970 to 1977 is the first of a series of books. I would love to see, you know, a, um, the making of advanced Dungeons and Dragons from 1978 to whatever that 2000, 2000, whenever third edition lost. And I'd love 
to see a historical thing about third edition too, because that's the edition that I started with. And I'd love to learn more about what was going on at that time. So I don't know. Hopefully more of this happens and I would like to see it, but let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments down below. I'll see you all next time. Uh, Mordfist. Hi, I've searched for something around D&D on YouTube. You've had the only video that helped me. Now I randomly found you here. Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm glad I could help you with whatever it is you were looking for on D&D on YouTube. So. I think 4E would be incredibly interesting just for the day. It would be very interesting to see uh, what went on with 4th edition, you know? Um... I'd be very curious to know like what the, the documents and things were going on there. And then again, the lead up to 5e. Because again, 5e at the start was drastically different than 5e now. Like We were in a very different boat back then. It wasn't as popular as it is now by any means. It still was very niche. Uh, at the start, you know, I mean, there wasn't, there was no critical role. There weren't all these podcasts and people doing all this stuff about D&D. It was very much just like any other edition of Dungeons and Dragons. And then it eventually it blew up. But at the start, it was basically like any other edition. It's like, we got to recoup what happened with fourth. And now Paizo is a thing with Pathfinder. They used to write books for us and adventures for us. And now they're making their own system. So be very interesting to see the history. I hope this continues with tomes covering basically each edition until we get to fifth. And honestly, I'd also be interested in a book about fifth edition, giving over the history of what happened behind the scenes that led up to, you know, the rules revisions. I don't know. Hopefully more of this happens and I would like to see it, but let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments down below. I'll see you all next time.